We've been speaking with top economists to understand what's next for the U.S. economy as we battle the coronavirus pandemic and the economic fallout. Today, I'm speaking with Danielle DiMartino Booth. She's an economic consultant and an author. Danielle, thanks so much for meeting with us. What is your boldest idea for how to stimulate the economy? There are things that we know that we can do. We know that 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 in the oil industry, for example, the energy sector has been absolutely decimated. The job losses have been unprecedented. As bad as 2019 was, 2020 has been worse. But we also know that a lot of the workers in these industries are highly skilled and that these skills can be transferred. So what I've never quite understood, and I'm talking about never quite understood for the past 12 years, is why if engineers around America have identified all of this, the improvements we need to our infrastructure, that it hasn't been a slam dunk bipartisan initiative. Immediately when the coronavirus hit, I said, this is it, it's the black swan, it's finally coming, we're gonna put all these out of work workers back to work. And it's, it, you know, the politicians will tell you, but that's a long-term plan. And I would counter by saying the coronavirus so far is looking like it's going to be long-term in terms of the amount of uncertainty that's going to be sitting on top of this economy. Let's put Americans back to work who we've already identified as having the appropriate skills to do so and move forward. Do you see that this as an opportunity where we can address racial inequality? Um, and talk to me a little bit about the economics behind that. We have left multiple generations of Americans behind through the public education system that has completely fallen apart. I'm aging myself, but when I was in high school, we had something called shop. And shop was a place that mostly younger boys could go and pick up vocational trades. Today, those younger boys are the electricians and the plumbers we spend a lot of our money on because there are too few of them. It's not a long-term job skill training that you're talking about, but it's recasting the net a little bit back in time and making sure that we bring the vocational training that's been missing, bring more of that back because as a population, we're not necessarily shrinking. Our demographics are better than that of other countries. We're living longer, which means we're gonna need skilled people for a lot longer. And we know for a fact that one out of every 10 employees worldwide was employed in travel and tourism countless more in retail, countless more in restaurants. We know that there will be permanent closures, meaning you've got a wonderful, rich pool of potential employees to retrain and rebuild out the workforce in a way that we don't have to talk about what we've been talking about prior to six months ago, the job skills shortage in the United States. It was an endless thing that went on for years and years and years. We don't have to do that again. We can fix it. Well, how do you see education changing in the face of the coronavirus pandemic? It's fine to have artistic children and art's a wonderful thing, but if you want to safeguard your children's future security, you want to make sure that they're able to have a skill that is going to see them through. We always talk about, is this stock recession proof? You know what? Is this job, is this profession recession proof? And that's how parents should approach education on the front end as opposed to the back end, which right now somewhere in the world is giving my 16 year old, my oldest child shivers because that's how we're going to approach looking for a college for him, lucky guy. <laughs> so um, there is no way, formal way to help take care of your child until they go to pre-K or Okay, so what do you do? How should the government solve that? I take off my economist hat from time to time and I put on my education reformer hat from time to time because I think that the two are intertwined and I think that income inequality has become a very economic issue grounded in a lack of education. There's a simple solution for making sure that young children are shepherded into the pre-K process. If, if a woman is paid six weeks after she has a child, if there's some kind of a government program that covers her and that after six or eight weeks, she's able to return to her job instead of childcare being so cost prohibitive that she has to drop out of the workforce until which time her child is old enough to go to public school. That is where poverty begins. If you find a way to care for children right 
from a very right from the time maternity leave ends if you cover child care the mother never falls out of the workforce the income does not subside and the mother's ability to see the work ethic and the import of that is going to be translated to her child who is picked up by the public education system which starts at pre-k by the way not in, in kindergarten which starts at pre-k and you you end up breaking the back of the cycle of poverty in this country you keep moms in the workforce, you fix the hardest thing there is to fix about education in America. What is the role and job of the Federal Reserve? And then we can move into, do you think that they're accomplishing that role? The role of the Federal Reserve should be to ensure that a dollar that you are paid in your paycheck holds its value. Not that there is a 2% inflation target such that in 50 years, your dollar's worthless. But the Fed has lost its way. It has lost its understanding of its very own primary mandate of minimizing inflation. The Fed is also supposed, also supposed to maximize employment. And sadly enough, the Fed has also failed at this mandate. If you look at what has been done in the post-pandemic era, the largest companies have been able to tack on more debt than ever before, thanks to the Federal Reserve's programs, none of which require companies maintain payrolls, maintain headcount. The only thing Fed policy has done post-COVID-19 is give very bad, insolvent, over-leveraged companies more leverage, such that when the eventual day of reckoning comes and the time is... It, and it is time to file for Chapter 11, we're seeing what we're increasingly seeing today, which is rather than a restructuring, which retains some portion of the, uh, of, the, of the workforce for company ABC, you're seeing companies go directly to liquidation because they have so much debt that any value has been absolutely eviscerated. I would not mind seeing a return to frugality. It goes against the strictures of the Federal Reserve and the fact that the Federal Reserve keeps interest rates at artificially low levels and constantly encourages households, corporations, and Uncle Sam to borrow. But that doesn't make it any different if you've actually experienced what it feels like to have your budget not make ends meet because of the shock of the coronavirus. And if that puts us on a better place longer term, so be it. I love that. Why does the national debt matter uh, from a policy standpoint? And should Congress be focused on it right now, especially when they're trying to pass another stimulus bill? What Congress needs to have done and needs to do in the name of possibly increasing the national debt is to have correctly crafted and targeted stimulus. And from that point on, it needs to understand that job skills training infrastructure spending, things that bring work back into the U.S. economy are going to a heck of a lot more than any kind of universal basic income program that not only increases the U.S. debt with very little to show for it, but this is the time to say if we are going to take our debt from 25 to 50 trillion dollars, that is when U.S. sovereignty begins to become at risk because other countries see that we've run up so much debt that we're no longer beholden to anybody else but the kindness of strangers. And at that point, you start to have real discussions about the sanctity of the U.S.'s dollar reserve currency status. In Europe, um, they've made a concerted effort to give out um, the unemployment money through the companies. In the U.S., we got it directly from the government. Which approach is better and why? The way that, that this is being approached is possibly going to come back and haunt Europe if the demand does not follow because you're keeping people in positions that ultimately might not exist in the end. So what it ends up being effectively, because if you look at some of these programs, they're 80, 90% reimbursement rates of their current salaries. So their lifestyles haven't changed at all. And I'm not saying that's good, bad, or in between, but if the same person ends up being out of work at the end of that period, then they're going to have, they're going to have had several years of their skills atrophying as opposed to being a little bit more productive, looking to what they're going to do in their next life. What am I going to be when I grow up the next time? Which I think a lot of people in the United States, and I've certainly been on my soapbox saying it, you have to, st you have to start thinking about how am I going to reinvent myself if, let's say, retail is forever going to be more remote or online. Are there industries that you see that will not bounce back from this? Or what, what do you think is the most resilient, like the inverse to? Well, I think the inverse is going to be any kind of a healthcare kind of a company that, that, is, that is going to push us into the next, whatever the next generation of delivering healthcare is going to look like. Whoever is 
who, whoever was already there is in the catbird seat because they've got the quote unquote first mover advantage. I think that security is also going to be something that is bigger and bigger, especially as tensions grow between and among different countries in this world. If I speak to CEOs uh, across America, if there's one thing that I'm hearing from them, it's that they have discovered that a certain portion of their workforce is equally productive, if not more productive, uh, working from home. And that has implications for office buildings, but much more importantly, again, because so many jobs have been created in travel and tourism in the last decade, there is a very good chance that a lot of business travel is gone for good. Are cities dead or will they come back? This will be longer lasting. The, the, the amount of building of high rise uh, apartments, of luxury apartments, of office space, of hotels, that is going to act as a major drag on a lot of the cities, not to be disparaging of history, I was in New York on 9-11, but this is not going to be as quick of an episode for cities. There's going to be a much longer period of rebuilding, but I tell you, just as soon as they let Texans back into New York, I'll be there. Is COVID the end of globalization? And maybe can we talk a little bit about supply chain and resiliency? I do see certain industries as coming closer to home going forward. And there will be a sense of, of regret. There has been a lot that's been destroyed because COVID data was not released in the aftermath of it initially hitting Wuhan. That's something that is undeniable. It's not some conspiracy theorist, but a lot of countries possibly were shut down to the, a greater degree than what they needed to be. But again, they were flying blind without the assistance of the Chinese data. So there's going to be economic resentment. There's going to be economic hardship in the aftermath of that. And I think that that is much more powerful than what happened all through 2019 with the trade war. What we're not necessarily seeing though is relocation of the supply chain that much closer to home. We're seeing countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, other Eastern Asian countries that are going to be beneficiaries. And I would say that that is going to be a very, a, a great area for investing for the next generation of long-term investors, because there will be growth there. And I think there would be more of an impetus, more enthusiasm for making sure that a lot of our closer manufacturing ties are between Canada, the United States and Mexico as we look forward. But as far as bringing all the jobs home, it's not gonna happen. What will the labor force look like if the US shuts down immigration? If you shut down immigration, your lowest income earners are gonna be the most affected because they're gonna be outside of our country and not picking our crops. And these are just anecdotes that, that came from farmers from California to the cotton fields of, of, of the South. And it's th these are patterns that have existed for generations, plural. Uh, the flip side of it is we know that the United States needs education reform, that we need to bring STEM uh, education back in our public school systems, but that this takes some time to do. So if we were to completely close our borders to, uh, to, to students who want to come into our even high schools, e even into some of our universities, then I think we'll be cutting off our nose despite our face. Because if, if you want to look across the corporate landscape of, of, uh, of CEOs and CFOs, many of them are students who came to the United States to study and stayed and today run some, some companies in America that employ hundreds of thousands of employees. And what good would it have done our economy to have closed our borders to them? So I think we need to be extremely thoughtful about the way we approach immigration in America. And I, I am the product of immigrants, uh, hardworking immigrants who made their way, live the American dream. And I'm proud to say that I am. And I think that that is, is and should remain a tradition in this country. What do you think is President Trump's economic legacy for just his first term? Um, regardless of who wins this fall, what will people remember him most by? I think that his legacy of making it easier to work in America is something that should never be discounted by, 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 by what history writes about him. And at a much more important level, you always have to know who your friends and your enemies are. And I think that the average American has learned more than they ever thought they would about how much China has encroached upon U.S. sovereignty and U.S. national security and the weaknesses that have emerged because we've been too entrusting of the Chinese as a factor of time and how important it possibly will be to make sure that we build out our own 5G network as a result. 
He has cast quite the light on China. Tariffs were completely boneheaded, the wrong way to go. Any economist would tell you that. But again, that's not what you're asking. You're asking about his legacy. And his legacy, I think, is one of no politician, at least over the next 10 or 20 years, being able to take away the spotlight that has been shown on our frenemies, if you will, in China.